involved, you know, going to exhibitions. So this is, uh, yeah, this is amazing. Whether you're blind, visually impaired or fully sighted, this exhibition is bringing photography to all. Fascinating. That report from Leila Hayes uh, just before I go. Uh, let me bring you the very latest on the total solar eclipse. Uh, we are in so many different places to see the live pictures. This Mexico, first of all, uh, large, large crowds we've seen gathering. They will be the first people that see this eclipse in about an hour's time. Let me take you to Niagara Falls because uh, as this uh, arches its way through Mexico, then America, then Canada will be there at uh, the various locations. Uh, we can also show you live pictures coming into us from California. Their shot of the sun. Well, Anita is here over the next couple of hours. She's going to be the actually taking you through best seat in town as uh, we'll show you all the latest live pictures. Thanks for being with me today. See you at the same time tomorrow. Hello. Monday brought us a bit of mix of weather types. While some of us had some spells of a warm spring sunshine, other areas were stuck under the cloud and rain all day. It's been a really wet first week of April and that unsettled theme continues for the next few days. So more blustery spells of rain at times and it's turning a little bit cooler than it has been too. So we've got low pressure driving our weather at the moment. Here it is. It's gradually easing its way eastwards through the rest of this evening, overnight and over the next 24 hours or so. It'll bring us some more wet and windy weather. Some thunderstorms initially for the far southeast, East Anglia. They clear northwards and then the bulk of the rain through tonight will be Northern Ireland, Scotland, perhaps western parts of England and Wales. Across Scotland, in fact, we could see some flooding by dawn because that rain is falling on very saturated ground. It's not going to be a cold night, six to nine degrees, but it is going to be windy for many of us, particularly down towards the southwest of England, through the English Channel, through the North Channel as well. More of this rain for Tuesday, lingering for Scotland, parts of northern England in particular as well, followed by sunshine and a few blustery showers from the west. Driest for parts of southern England through the day, but gusts of wind, 45 miles per hour or so in land but stronger than that gales around some of the coastal regions and we've got really high tides with a full moon at the moment so we could be seeing some coastal flooding as well top temperatures 8 to 12 on tuesday so cooler than recent days especially so when you add on the wind chill so the blue colors that colder air mass with us for a time through the middle part of the week but later on wednesday and the next warm front moves in from the atlantic bringing some warmer air and some rain too. Could be an early frost in the east, I think, on Wednesday, but the cloud increases, the rain moves its way in, and the winds are going to be picking up through the day as well. So another unsettled day, more fairly unwelcome rain for some of us, heaviest in the northwest. Temperatures about 10 to 15 for most of us, so just starting to edge up, certainly compared to Tuesday. And then we've got this lingering front. We're heading into Thursday now. I don't think there'll be too much rain on that, but there's likely to be quite a lot of low cloud mist and murk around some southern hills and coasts, for instance, first thing on Thursday. Bright the skies from the word go towards the north and I think through the day the sunshine should tend to break up that cloud. So a bit of a drier, brighter sort of day for many of us and a touch warmer. We're looking at highs in Norwich and London up to about 19 degrees or so. 20 Celsius possible in the south for Friday and Saturday. Then things turn cooler and more unsettled into next week. Today we're looking at the state of British politics. Asking is technology ruining football? Are we too obsessed with our phones? Helen from Hull wants to know, how hot's the planet gonna get? And we'll explain why prices keep going up and up. Also, Rach, did you know space has its own smell? Really? What of? The world is fast moving and can be confusing. So let's talk about it. Five Live Breakfast with Rachel and Rick. Listen on BBC Sounds. What does it take to become a top opera star like tenor Jonas Kaufmann, Welsh bass baritone Sabrin Terrell, and Greek-American soprano Maria Callas? I'm on a mission to find out how opera is trying to attract new audiences and reinvent itself. I think music has the power to change the world. Take me to the opera. Watch on BBC iPlayer.
At six, a nationwide manhunt for a 25-year-old man suspected of stabbing a woman in broad daylight in Bradford. Habiba Masum is still believed to be in the country and is described as very dangerous. Officers say the victim was known to West Yorkshire police also this evening. Millions of people across North America are hoping to see a total solar eclipse in the next few hours. I'm in Dallas, where in just under two hours, we'll be plunged into darkness in the middle of the day. The post office minister says those responsible for the Horizon IT scandal should go to jail if there's evidence of wrongdoing. And hello, hello, why are French soldiers changing the guard at Buckingham Palace? And stay with us here on BBC News for continuing coverage and analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. Good evening to you. A nationwide manhunt is underway for a 25-year-old man suspected of stabbing a woman to death as she pushed her baby in a pram. Habiba Masum is wanted on suspicion of the murder of Kulsama Akta, who was 27, and attacked multiple times in broad daylight in the Westgate area of Bradford on Saturday. West Yorkshire police have confirmed the baby wasn't harmed and they've referred themselves to the police watchdog because the victim had been in touch with officers. Police say the suspect remains very dangerous. Danny Savage has our top story. Where is Habiba Massam? Police have just released this picture of the 25-year-old taken on Saturday, the day he's suspected of carrying out an horrific attack on a woman he knew, who was named this afternoon as Kulsama Akta. Kulsama was with her young baby at this time and was walking along Westgate when she was stabbed, attacked and stabbed multiple times. Emergency services were called at 3.21pm. However, despite the best efforts of members of the public, ambulance crews and hospital staff, Kulsama sadly lost her life due to the injuries. Her baby is safe and well and was not harmed in this incident. The 27-year-old mother and her child were walking here in the centre of Bradford. The shocking incident has deeply affected those who tried to help Kulsama in the moments after the attack. I heard screaming and I came out, run to the wards to the, where the scene happened. And then uh, what I did, I tried to check uh, poles and everything, and, but there was no poles. And then within a few minutes, doctor arrived. Just down there is Bradford City Centre, where the attack happened at about 20 past three on Saturday afternoon. Ten minutes later, the main suspect in this case gets on a bus on Market Street. Ten minutes after that at 3.40, he gets off the bus in the Bradford Moor Park area, just to the east of the city centre. He hasn't been seen since. Police say the victim and suspect were known to each other, although they won't elaborate on the exact relationship. There is relief here, though, that the baby was unharmed. For this young child, long after we've all disappeared and the news has moved on and we've completely forgotten about this incident, that young baby will grow up motherless. And that is, that's the tragedy here. CCTV cameras overlook the crime scene. What they recorded will be vital to the investigation. Police say a knife was recovered here. Habiba Massam is from the Oldham area and has links to Burnley and Chester, where police raids have since taken place and another man has been arrested. Anyone who sees him has been warned not to approach him and immediately call 999. Two other important points to come out of the press briefing at this police, police station behind me this afternoon. West Yorkshire Police has referred itself to the IOPC, the Independent Office for Police Conduct. That's due to contact they had with the victim in the days before she was killed. They won't go into any detail on that, but they have referred themselves to the IOPC. 
And this man, the main suspect, was last seen in the Bradford Moor Park area. And police have made a direct appeal to taxi drivers in Bradford who may have picked him up that afternoon. He would have been paying cash, they say, to come forward with any information. That's the last place he was seen. They want to know where he is now. Clive. All right, Danny, thank you for that. Danny Savage there live in Bradford. Millions of people across Mexico, America and Canada are hoping to experience the drama of a total solar eclipse in the next few hours. Now, the phenomenon involves the moon blocking out most of the light from the sun, casting a shadow over the Earth, apart from a halo of scattered light around its perimeter. Now, an estimated 31 million people will be in the path of the eclipse, with the best view for those watching in the area along this dotted red line as it moves up from Mexico. Mexico across the US and into Canada. Viewing in the UK will be less impressive as we're well outside the zone. So in a moment, we'll hear from Will Grant, who's in Mexico City. But first, Emma Vardy is in Dallas, Texas, hanging out with some of the folks there. Excited about the big moment, Emma? <laughs> We have been under a few clouds here, but that hasn't changed this mood of excitement for what is about to happen. This eclipse is so special because it crosses many major cities. So as you say, millions of people will get to experience it. And in just under two hours here, we will experience four minutes of complete darkness in the middle of the day. Those arriving early to get a front row seat at Niagara Falls were treated to another solar spectacle this morning. One more reminder of the power of our sun to create a cosmic vision. It's just going to be like a beautiful sight, like yep. Niagara Falls and the eclipse in the sky. This is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. Some planning to seize the moment. A little bit later, there might be a little bit of a surprise going on that we're pretty <laughs> excited about. Throughout the path of totality, travelers are hoping for clear skies. Hey, today is Eclipse Day. I am so excited. Super excited. It looks really nice at the moment. I just hope it stays that way. From west coast to east, millions are preparing to witness this phenomenon, being called a once-in-a-century event because it passes over the entirety of North America. After seven years and three and a half thousand miles, here we are in upstate New York, and we're getting ready for the eclipse, which is going to be happening in a couple of hours' time. The shadow of the moon has been approaching the Earth for several hours this morning. Right now it is racing toward us in the eastern United States at a speed of about 1,500 miles an hour. Not since 1970 has there been an eclipse passing over such a populated area of North America. 11.15 now and totality has reached the tiny Channel Island of Alderney. While the UK last experienced a total solar eclipse in 1999. Scientists at NASA will be watching today's eclipse closely. The space agency is sending rockets into the path of darkness to study the outer atmosphere of the sun known as its corona. So there's a lot of things we can learn. Uh, obviously, the astronomical aspects, you're looking at the corona of the, of the sun because that's the opportunity when the moon is right in front of it. But also you can look at what effects this actually has on the atmosphere. Cloudy or not, it's still important not to look directly at the sun during an eclipse or you could damage your eyesight. So it's eclipse glasses at the ready as the moment is nearly upon us. Right now, the shadow of the moon is approaching Mexico, where millions on the west coast will be first to experience the awe-inspiring sight. Emma Vardy, BBC News. And that's exactly where we're heading. Mexico City, to be exact. Will Grant, our correspondent, is live there. Some suggestions, Will, that some people are able to see the eclipse already where you are. Well, if they can't yet, Clive, it's certainly just minutes away. It's getting very, very close. And I think there's something really poetic and romantic about the fact that it's Mexico that gets to see this first as it sweeps across North America, a country, of course, whose uh, ancestors were great mathematicians, uh, accomplished astronomers. Um, the ancient Maya, the Aztecs, of course, could, it said, predict and understand eclipses when they came uh, to pass in, in, in centuries past. Um, that said, they saw them as portents of something terrible happening, of death, of, of, of clashes between gods. And to counteract that, the, the Aztecs used human sacrifice. But don't worry, I don't think we're going to see any human sacrifice today. The biggest problem, as far as I can see, is people can't get enough of those glasses to look at the thing directly. 
kids being told they can watch it in the playground as long as the classrooms are allowing that to happen or even they can stay home from school to watch it with their families. Put your specs on, Will. All right, Will Grant there in Mexico City. And uh, you can watch coverage of the eclipse all night live on the BBC iPlayer. Just search for Total Solar Eclipse. Now, the White House says it's taking discussions to secure the release of Israeli hostages very seriously and is hoping to secure a deal as soon as possible. But there are conflicting reports emerging about how talks are progressing between Israel and Hamas. Meanwhile, Palestinians who've returned to the ruins of the city of Khan Yunis in Gaza have been speaking about the widespread destruction left behind in the wake of the withdrawal of Israeli forces yesterday. Jeremy Bowen is live in southern Israel with the very latest. Uh, Jeremy, is there any progression from where you are on the possibility of a hostage deal? Well, there have been all those leaks, rumours and reports that you've been talking about, Clive. And I think one thing we've learned in the last six months is that when these negotiations happen, reports like that do come out and sometimes they're not correct. So we've, I would just hang on a bit until a deal, if it comes, is announced. But I think what may have changed is that the Americans are very, very keen to have one. Joe Biden's under a lot of uh, pressure at home uh, to try to bring an end to all of this. It's, it's costing him politically. And one way of doing it would be perhaps through a ceasefire. Now, those uh, Khan Yunis scenes today, uh, since the Israelis pulled out, there have been a load of people going back, trying to see if there's anything left of their homes. Now, all that might play into the, the, uh, the negotiations in Cairo because perhaps that Israeli withdrawal might be presented to Hamas as a little bit of a concession. But at the same time, Mr. Netanyahu has just announced uh, that the, he has a date for an offensive on Rafa. So in other words, the troops would go back. That is a gesture towards his own right wing and he needs them to try to stay in power. So in other words, what, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of politics, diplomacy and negotiations going on. It is fluid and it's difficult and no deal is guaranteed. OK, Jeremy, thank you. Jeremy Bowen there live in southern Israel. Two men have been jailed for, the, for life for the murder of the footballer Cody Fisher, who was stabbed to death in a nightclub in Birmingham on Boxing Day in 2022. Remy Gordon, on the left, will have to serve at least 26 years, and Cammy Carpenter must serve a minimum of 25 years. There's new evidence that people living with long COVID have inflammation in their blood, and this may provide clues as to how best to treat the condition. A UK study of hundreds of patients who've been seriously ill with COVID suggests their immune system remains overactive long after catching the virus. Well, Fergus Walsh is here with the full story. Fergus. Thanks, Clive. Well, millions of people have been affected by long COVID. And although most eventually make a full recovery, some struggle with symptoms for months or even years. The study followed more than 650 patients in the UK who'd all been to hospital with severe COVID. Six months on, two in three were still experiencing symptoms, including heart and lung problems, such as shortness of breath, fatigue, gut issues, anxiety, depression, and brain fog. And the researchers analyzed their blood and found a list of proteins, these chemicals which are markers for inflammation of the immune system, which are useful while the body is fighting an infection but not once the virus is gone. The scientists say there's strong evidence that long COVID is caused by different types of post-viral inflammation. I think this is really exciting for us. It's the biggest study of its kind. It's taken a long time for us to get this far, but it is finally pointing to some very specific um, pathways that might be underlying long COVID that could be targeted in future trials of treatment. Now this is Tracy Evans. She was a care assistant before contracting COVID in early 2021. Tracy ended up on a ventilator in hospital and three years on, she can't work due to a raft of long COVID symptoms. I have fatigue so bad. Um, even just changing a pillowcase on a bed is it's breathless. Uh, I can't walk far. 
even to a local shop, which isn't far. I can't walk. And I have shooting pains all over my body. I've got really bad brain fog. I forget what I'm saying. I forget what things are. Uh, if somebody's talking to me, I can just stare at them blank. A blood test to help diagnose long COVID is still some way off. It's hoped this research could eventually lead to new treatments with existing drugs being trialled to target areas of the immune system which are triggered by long COVID. Clive. OK, Fergus, thank you. Fergus Walsh, our medical editor there. It is a quarter past six, our top story this evening. And the nationwide manhunt is underway for a man suspected of stabbing to death a woman in broad daylight in Bradford. And a little later, we'll have more on the total eclipse and where you may best be able to see it. And stay with us here on BBC News for continuing coverage and analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. The post office minister says those responsible for the Horizon IT scandal should go to jail if there's evidence of wrongdoing. In a BBC special broadcast, Kevin Hollinrake met dozens of sub-postmasters who'd been affected. Three months after their stories were immortalised in a TV drama, sub-postmasters returned to the place where they held their very first meeting. The public inquiry into what happened will resume this week, with senior post office bosses among those giving evidence. More than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly prosecuted between 1999 and 2015 due to computer errors. Here's John Kay. Some had travelled hundreds of miles to the place where their fight began. Sub-postmasters who came here for that very first meeting 15 years ago. It's taken this long, but as you can see, I was the only one it was happening to, you know. It just, it sums it up, doesn't it? All these people here and, yeah, we were all told we were the only ones. Fanny Compton. Fanny Compton. Just a place to start really annoying the hell out of the post office. <laughs> Today, no actors, but nearly 60 real sub-postmasters and families here for a special edition of BBC Breakfast. Some of them have never spoken about their stories before, even to their nearest and dearest. Some of them have travelled hundreds of miles today to be here. We really appreciate you uh, all coming and we're looking forward to, to hearing from as many of you as we possibly can. Sharon told us she lost nearly everything when she was wrongly accused by the post office in Sunderland. They just don't know what they've done to people. They don't, they don't realise it. There's no compassion in them, there's nothing. This is my husband's photograph. He was 39 years old when he uh, died, two months after being um, suspended from the post office. He was a healthy man. He felt very ashamed of what happened and within two months he was dead. Listening, the government's post office minister. We still suffer because all these people in this room are still suffering as victims and are not survivors yet. The minister agreed compensation hasn't come soon enough. And then he went further. People should be prosecuted. That's my view. And I think you and other people I've spoken to, I certainly feel, people within the, who are within the post office and possibly further afield should go to jail. But this village hall meeting also wanted to celebrate the new friendships that started here. We're going to get through it. Yeah, we'll be OK. We'll I don't be know okay. if you can see at home, but these two are holding hands so tightly. Oh, you OK? Yeah, Mark, tell us about Gizmo. He's, he's your <coughs> support dog. He's my support dog for first my diabetes, but also for my anxiety and depression. He keeps me calm and makes me feel a reason to live on. Now you've done it and you've told your story to your friends, your family, to the country. How does that feel? Um, like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders um, to actually talk about it, where I've kept everything locked away inside and not told anybody. Um, I feel a lot lighter. John Kay, BBC News, Fenny Compton. 
The state pension has gone up by 8.5 percent. That's because of the so-called triple lock, the government's pledge for pensions to keep pace with inflation, wage rises, or by 2.5 percent, whichever's the highest. Here's Coletta Smith. It's a big birthday for Jack in a few weeks' time. Nearly 91. 91, oh my goodness. Well, is that this month. This month, oh, well, happy birthday. He still helps out in the shop run by his and son, but Jack lives off the state pension, which is going up. Well, it's, so it's a little bit more in the pot to go around. And, and that, that is good, yeah. What I'd like to know is how much my pension would increase each week. If you're retired relatively recently, within the last eight years, then you'll be on the flat rate of pension, which has now gone up to £221 a week, an increase of £17 a week. But for the vast majority of pensioners, if they've retired before 2016, then they're on the basic state pension. That's now at a lower rate, but it's increased up to £169 a week, an increase of £13 a week. But it's not as straightforward as it sounds, because a big chunk of people will now be earning enough to start paying tax. Thelma's worried she'll be one of them. I did have um, a work pension, and then when I sort of left there, I transferred it into a private one. So I don't get an awful lot, but I think it just tips me over the end. So what I really want to know is if I'm going to be taxed with having this pension increase. If you earn anything extra on top of your state pension, perhaps a private pension, perhaps you're getting some return from your savings at the moment, you may find that you're pushed into that first bracket of income tax for the first time. So anything you earn over and above the level of £12,570 a year will be taxed. With multiple illnesses, Jean depends on personal independence payments. But with her tiny companion to feed and a mobility scooter to charge, life doesn't come cheap. When you get a disability, things change dramatically for you, you know, and it's not an, e it's not an easy life, you know. It's not easy at all. What I want to know is why aren't benefits going up enough to cover everything? If you receive any benefits payments, whether that's personal independence payments, universal credit, child benefits or job seekers allowance, you'll see that money go up by 6.7% from this month whenever the money usually lands into your account. The reason it's 6.7% is because that was the rate of inflation in September and that was the moment that the government decided to pin this benefits up rating to. So it's still a careful balance for those depending on benefits or a pension. Coletta Smith, BBC News, Gorton in Manchester. Now, Everton Football Club has been penalised a second time for breaking the Premier League's financial rules. They've been deducted two points. The club says it'll appeal. Katie Gornall is at the club stadium at Goodison Park. Katie, and bad news for a club struggling and just above the relegation zone. That's right, Clive, and it could have been worse for Everton. If you look at the Independent Commission's written reasons, the Premier League had wanted this to be a five-point deduction. Now, fans have had to become familiar with these profit and sustainability rules this season. They state that clubs are allowed to lose up to £105 million over a rolling three-year period. In this instance, Everton breached that by over £16 million. And as you say, they've already been hit with a ten-point deduction this season, reduced to six on a period. So it all affects, and that was for a, a breach in a previous accounting period, it all affects their survival hopes potentially this season. Today they drop to 16th in the table, just two points above the relegation zone with seven games to play. Everton have said they are appealing. They released a statement today saying that they welcome the Commission giving credit to the majority of their mitigating circumstances, but added that they were extremely concerned at the inconsistency of the punishments with four different commissions issuing four different points deductions this season. And the fans here are certainly feeling hard done by this. Could all end up, add up, to, add up to a messy end to this season, Clive. All right, Katie, thank you. Katie Gornall there at Goodison Park. Now, history has been made at Buckingham Palace with French soldiers taking part in the changing of the guard ceremony for the very first time. Meanwhile, 16 British soldiers from the Coldstream, Coldstream Guards were across the channel at the Elysee Palace. It's all to mark the 120th anniversary of the signing of the Entente Cordiale, a series of agreements which helped usher in an era of friendship between the UK and France. Here's Sam Harrison. 
It's not often the French national anthem blares out at Buckingham Palace. But today it marked a military parade, the like of which we've never seen before. French boots on the ground to mark the 120th anniversary of the Entente Cordiale. An alliance between Britain and France struck in 1904. Thousands lined the streets today to watch history unfold as French troops took part in the iconic changing of the guard for the very first time. A moment, centuries in the making. This is a military first. French soldiers here today weren't just here to carry out a piece of ceremonial duty. They'd become the first troops from outside the Commonwealth to take part in this prestigious ritual. In Paris, sentiments were echoed. In an unusual move, God Save the King was sung by a military choir. And British troops became the first from outside France to change the guard at the Elysee Palace. Defining moments to mark a relationship which has endured tough times. Welcome to the President of the French Republic. Arguably none tougher than in 1939. On the brink of another world war, the 35th anniversary of the Entente Cordiale recognised the importance of the military alliance, and it stayed strong through the decades. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs. Queen Elizabeth II marked its centenary in Paris in 2004. It remains an historical landmark. And today's celebrations show how the Entente Cordiale still has a part to play in the modern world. Sam Harrison, BBC News, Buckingham Palace. We're going to return to the solar eclipse now, and it isn't just America and Canada where you'll be able to see it. A partial eclipse will also be visible in much of Western England and Scotland and all of Wales and Ireland. It'll be visible for just a few minutes in some places, but for up to half an hour, the further west you travel and uh, here's the view at the moment and we're going to talk to Sarah Gervin uh, who uh, is in Belmollet in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. Sarah, how's it looking there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A bit wild, as you can tell, Clive, here in the west coast of Ireland. But we are told that there's a 44% chance that we'll be able to see a partial eclipse later this evening. We're told it'll be just before 8 o'clock. We may be able to see it for about three minutes. But we're advised um, to make the most of what is a partial eclipse. What you need is an uninterrupted view of the western horizon. We certainly have that here. And you need clear weather. Now, that is certainly something that we do not have this evening. But there's still going to be a viewing party here. People are very hopeful that it's going to work out. It's been organised by Bill and Elizabeth who join us. Bill, this is wild. Oh, are we going to... It sure is and a big cave meal of fault and welcome to the uh, wild rugged west coast of Ireland as you can see. But we're optimistic. We're hoping for the uh, weather to clear and to get a, to, to at least see something anyway later on, you know. Well, let, let's hope so. We're going to be at that viewing party, so we'll keep you updated on what we see or what we don't see during what will be a very special and we hope a very spectacular event here in County Mayo.
You're watching The World Today. Welcome from our special titles, which you may have noticed. You will, of course, know that we are continuing with our build up to this huge event, a total solar eclipse that we are expecting uh, to see in the next half hour or so for the first time, uh, that totality where the Earth is plunged into darkness uh, as the moon passes between the sun and Earth, entirely covering the face of the sun. So the root that is plunged into darkness is called the path of totality. And in places along that path, people will be able to view the sun's corona, that is the outer atmosphere of the, the sun, which usually isn't visible or distinctive because of the sun's brightness. We're going to be in lots of places across that route, along that route, talking to our correspondents to bring you all the atmosphere from those watch parties. And you are watching uh, the world today as we build up to the total solar eclipse. Uh, it will start off in the Cook Islands in the Pacific, uh, then head across to Mexico, across 13 U.S. states and make its way up into Canada. This is the route where people will be uh, plunged into darkness as the moon passes between the sun and Earth, totally uh, covering up the face of the sun. In other areas around this, uh, people will see a partial eclipse, but it is this total solar eclipse that we are focusing on and we will take you if you're not in one of those locations watching the eclipse safely through special glasses uh, we have got you absolutely covered because we will be uh, talking to our correspondents along that route known as the path of totality and that is the route on the map on your screens and joining me here in the studio is Edward Bloomer senior astronomy manager at the Royal Observatory and of course, we want to hear about the science, what this means uh, for exploration, the study of the sun, the study of the uh, celestial spectacle that we're about to see. But first of all, you must be incredibly excited about this. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a rare opportunity to see the, the mechanics of the solar system at work, you know, right in front of you. Um, it's, it's pretty special. Yeah, so um, what are the key things that scientists are looking to discover from this event? Well, I mean, we've, we've, we've studied eclipses for a long period of time and they've contributed to lots of different things. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're quite interested in the outer atmosphere of the sun and uh, with our ability to, to live stream things for lots of people to contribute, uh, we're able to basically observe it completely in real time to get lots and lots of high resolution pictures. So that's quite interesting. Um, but, but as I say, a long history of doing lots of different science with uh, eclipses. Mm, what, what's the, uh, the real world implication of, of all of that sort of study? Well, I, I mean, uh, lots of it is confirming things, um, but also you've essentially got a giant sun shield. So when the moon uh, obscures the sun, then you get to see that outer atmosphere of the sun um, in a way that's just not possible uh, with with the rest of the sun. This is the, the corona. Way. Yes, this is the corona. Yeah, um, and uh, but but even before that, we've we've tested things like the uh, general theory of relativity uh, back in 1919 by looking at the starlight from stars near the sun, uh, the way their starlight was actually deflected by uh, the sun itself. And I've been reading how scientists are also going to be studying responses on Earth, both you know from people and, and animals, for example, and, and, and how they behave. Yes, absolutely. So I mean, it's it's going to get dark, um, and you know you can understand that sort of in, in your mind. But but what effect it has on nature, and also what effect it has on the atmosphere itself, the ionosphere uh, is is an area of study. Uh, certainly, um, when we have this darkness cast, um, what does it actually do? leading up to it, during it, uh, and afterwards as well. How unusual is it to get um, a, a path of totality that is crossing over such heavily populated areas? <laughs> That's quite hard to, to say. I mean, the US has, has been quite lucky. It had, it had a good one uh, just a couple of years ago. I mean, eclipses happen a lot, but by their very nature, um, are, 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 uh, well, if you're in a particular place, it's pretty hard uh, uh, to, to, to find one uh, at a convenient time. Uh, yeah. And, and here in the UK, what can people see? Unfortunately, here in the UK, we're sort of split in two. In the west and the north, you're going to see a partial solar eclipse. In the south and the east, it's, it's no good for us. We won't see anything at all. But the further north and west you can get, the more of the sun is going to be obscured by the passing moon. OK. Um, but 
Obviously, people can watch it here with us on BBC News. And we will, um, as I've been explaining to our viewers, we have uh, correspondents right along the route, this path of totality, who will be able to tell us what is happening there and bring us that experience from there. Um, Edward, um, ha have you witnessed eclipses uh, in, in person, as it were? I, I have, but, but not very many. I mean, uh, because they're so rare, you, you have to go and chase them around the world if you want to be. I it's mean, a, bit so like, a bit like storm chasers. You uh, have to chase those moments. Yes, absolutely. And, and some people are really, really into it. And, they, and they, you know, that's where they plan their holidays. They go to the next place. So I've seen a few. Um, and, and probably the one that most people in the UK are familiar with was in 1919. Uh, sorry, 1999, I beg your um, uh, Cornwall got a, a total uh, solar eclipse. But we're not going to get one in the UK until 2090. So if you want to see one, you're going to have to travel. You've got to travel. Yeah, absolutely. Edward, thank you very much. I know you're going to stay with me and uh, talk to us about all of this as we uh, go through the next hour and a half or so. Um, so let me show you what pictures we can uh, bring you right now. I'm looking at the screens. We have uh, um, pictures of, of people gathering for these amazing watch parties. Um, it really is a huge event. Uh, I think we can bring you those pictures anyway. Let's see if we can pull those up. Um, not at the moment, but I'm very glad I've got Edward with me because he is here to talk to us and, and keep the conversation going, I'm pleased to say, before we cross to, to our correspondents. Um, so just put this into a bit more context for us, Edward, in terms of how um, unusual or not an event this is. So I, I think one of the important things is it's unusual because so many people are going to see it. I mean, it's a great opportunity for sort of public engagement with, you know, science communication because it's cutting that, that path uh, right across sort of North America. It, loads and loads of people are able to get to it. Most of the time, the eclipse path goes across the sea because the Earth is is, is covered in ocean. Um, so I, I think that's one important thing. I think also there's so many opportunities for citizen science. Um, lots of organisations have decided to, to try and really make use of people. So getting them to take pictures, getting them to um, uh, download apps and, and, and record the sun. Um, once you've got thousands and thousands of people participating, you can get essentially a, a, a big, very detailed record of exactly what's going on throughout the eclipse. Yeah, so really getting people involved, ordinary people involved in this. Absolutely. And not, and not just, uh, you sort of mentioned it before, not just, you know, not just sort of the astronomy part of the eclipse, but the effect that it has on nature as well. That's mm -hmm. a big part of the citizen science sort of initiative. Yeah, we've, we've seen examples, haven't we, of where, um, you know, we saw with the, the, the dreadful tsunami in, in Bali, how animals reacted to that before it, it happened. So we know that animals will, will pick up on things before humans do. Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, I mean uh, there's temperature changes, there's, uh, you, you know, just the, the light levels. So they will, they will react. The, the question is, can we build up a sort of framework of how exactly they're going to react? Yes, uh, and, and understand exactly what's driving sure. that, that behaviour. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the, the, the weather then, Edward, in terms of um, what sort of impact that will have on um, experiencing the, the eclipse. If there's a bit of cloud cover, even quite a lot of cloud cover, w will that have a dramatic impact? Um, certainly in terms of us being able to see things. I, I mean, of course, with the, the caveat of that you, you would never look at the sun uh, directly. Um, but yeah, cloud cover can, can really spoil things. And you know, the extra caveat, even if there is cloud cover, don't look towards where the sun is. Yes. Um, I think sometimes in the memory, it becomes a bit exaggerated when people think back to an eclipse they've seen, they sort of think, well, it went as dark as, you know, midnight and, and I could see everything and it all, it, it, all the birds stopped singing. And it's not always as dramatic it, as that. It takes on a dramatic quality, it, yeah. It does a bit. Now, a, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a partial solar eclipse uh, in the UK and um, it was completely cl clouded over. I think, I think no one got a good view of it and it went a bit dark but it's not quite as, you know, switch off all the lights uh, dark as you might think. Yeah, it isn't the plunging of daytime into darkness, that true, that true dramatic uh, moment. Absolutely. And, and the, the moment of totality it is, a, is a moment. I mean, it, it lasts for maybe a sort of maximum of about four minutes for this one. Um, so it's, it's not, um, uh, although the eclipse process itself is going to take quite a while, that, that moment where it goes as dark as it can is, is, is just a short period of time. 
but very memorable, I think. Yes. Um, Edward, do stay with me. Thank you very much for the moment because we can now, as promised, uh, talk to our correspondents who are going to be experiencing, uh, for the most part, we hope, weather permitting that uh, totality. Uh, joining me are Will Grant, who is in Mexico City. And Will, I know you're not going to get the, the total eclipse there, the partial eclipse, I believe, in Mexico City, but a total eclipse elsewhere in Mexico. Uh, Nomia Iqbal is in Mesquite, Texas. Helena Humphrey is, uh, there's Nomia with her glasses on, uh, Helena Humphrey in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Nada Torfik is at Niagara Falls, as we were discussing earlier, probably one, the one time that Niagara Falls will be uh, rather put into second place by the spectacle in the sky. Um, let's go to Will then, first of all, in Mexico City. And Will, just confirm for me that that is correct. Um, you, you won't get the, the total eclipse in Mexico City, but you will elsewhere in the country. No, I feel I'm missing out slightly compared to all the other people in these boxes next to us uh, who are getting to see the full experience. Nevertheless, is, it's still going to be pretty impressive, I think, in Mexico City, somewhere between 75 and 80 percent. So that's not bad. And for a city this size, for the entire population to be able to go onto their rooftops or go into the streets even and be able to see that is quite something. It's a great opportunity for the schools and the school system to make a real kind of uh, practical astronomy lesson out of it. Um, in fact, some schools have even told uh, the families that if they'd rather and they'd like to watch it as a family, uh, that kids can, can stay home for the day to sort of enjoy the experience altogether. Uh, and there is also something really quite romantic about it being Mexico, the first country on this sweeping movement north through North America because this is a country who's steeped in the stars. This is a country whose ancient peoples were uh, incredible astronomers, accomplished mathematicians, whose whole belief systems and religious practices were all really built around an understanding of the stars. And, and indeed, who could even predict, in the case of the ancient Maya and the Aztecs, um, uh, eclipses themselves. So there is a real kind of beautiful connection to the past here. OK, uh, Will, thank you very much. Yes, I love that idea of a thread of uh, people standing in wonder looking at the skies. Um, let's go. In fact, there we have people standing um, poised to stare towards the skies in Mexico, as Will was saying, one of the first places that will uh, experience uh, the totality, that complete darkness as the moon uh, passes between the sun and Earth. Uh, before it makes its way in that great sweep uh, through the US, through 13 states and on up towards Canada. Well, um, we're going to go to uh, Nomia Iqbal now. Um, Nomia, just remind us where you are. I'm in Texas, so You're we Texas. have got <laughs> partial eclipse. Yeah, uh, we've got partial eclipse, which is why I've got my uh, very special total eclipse sunglasses on. Uh, the, uh, we're being warned over the speakerphone, correctly so, to put your sunglasses on if you want to stare at the sun. So it, we have partial eclipse, so it looks like the, the moon has taken a little nibble of the sun. Um, and you can, obviously, you have to wear these uh, as the, the, the moon is approaching. You can take them off once we go into complete darkness, of course, and that is due to happen in about an hour's time. So that's 1.40 uh, local time, and we are expected to be plunged into darkness for just a little over four minutes, which is quite a long time. I'm just reminded of someone that I spoke to here in the park. There's lots of people who camped here overnight, who've come here for the day, ready for their celestial experience. Uh, he, he is an astrophysicist. His name is Paul Ricker. And he said to me that uh, try not to be tempted to take photos um, and selfies. I mean, there are people doing that. They've got filters on their, their phones to do so. But he said the key thing, he's already experienced a solar eclipse. Just enjoy the moment because it's pretty awe-inspiring. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the safety message is a very important one. Um, you know, without those special filters or special glasses, clearly, you know, people could risk damage to their eyes. Um, but we are we are showing uh, our viewers at the moment, Nomia, as you described it, it looks like the moon has taken a, a nibble out of the sun. That will become more and more pronounced, and of course, until the sun looks like uh, just a crescent. And these pictures uh, have been taken from San Diego in uh, California. So uh, quite a sight. It really is awe-inspiring, I think. 
Um, that's Nomi Alepsa. Cross now to Helena Humphrey. Our World News America presenter is in Cleveland, Ohio, where, as we were discussing earlier, Helena, uh, there are big watch parties going on, uh, as indeed there are in many, many locations uh, around um, America. Just give us a sense of the atmosphere there. It's electric, and I have to say I'm feeling quite excited just listening to Nomia there talking about the moon taking a nibble out of the sun, knowing that, of course, that eclipse will be on the way here in Ohio very soon. Now, I don't want to be accused of tempting fate, of course, but just take a look at that scene behind me. Beautiful, bright blue skies here in Ohio. We came in in the early hours of the morning, like many people here, trying to avoid those traffic jams. There was some cloud cover, but now we can see that it is clear up and Will was talking about that romanticism of the moment there I think in Mexico and certainly Ohio is also steeped in eclipse history it hasn't seen a total eclipse since 1806 that was just three years into its statehood and there's a wonderful story about that time about a tribal leader from the indigenous people uh, from the Shawnee tribe called Tecumseh and Tecumseh was trying to uh, organize native tribes against the settlers that were moving over from the east and he was trying to show his power and he was set a challenge by the governor of Indiana at the time saying, well, if you and your brother and other tribal leaders are so important, why don't you stop the sun in the sky? Why don't you cause the moon to alter its course? And they replied saying, well, we will um, in 50 days time. And in fact, what came to pass was that on the 16th of June, 1806 there was a total eclipse and that essentially solidified his leadership among that tribe uh, as part of that resistance against the settlers and I think it's just a wonderful example of how this isn't just about the solar system and science it's about the stories that bind us and it's also about the past and the future and how this will connect us and here in Ohio we won't be seeing another total eclipse for another 400 years. Helena thank you very much. And uh, as we stay on these uh, amazing pictures taken from uh, Oklahoma, uh, live pictures coming into us, uh, you can see there just the hint of uh, that shadow appearing on the surface of the sun, a little bit being eaten out of the, the sun. And of course, the moon will move and we will see that sun being eaten into, as it were, more and more until we have just a crescent uh, before approaching that complete totality. And uh, let's bring in uh, Neda Torfik, who uh, is at Niagara Falls. Um, Neda, I was just looking at uh, one of our screens here in the studio. I could see you a second ago trying on your glasses. Um, just bring us up to date with the, the situation there. Yeah, well, we're a bit more at mercy uh, with the weather here than some of my other colleagues uh, across the country. We have been looking up at the sky to see if you can see the sun through the clouds. So far, uh, we do not have much of a break uh, in that, uh, but we'll see how it progresses over the next hour or so. But nevertheless, I mean, just taking the scene behind me, I'm at Terrapin Point on the U.S. side of Niagara Falls, right here by the Horseshoe of the falls so a spectacular setting as you know tourists came here to cross off two items from their bucket list to be able to see Niagara Falls many of them for the first time as well as experiencing this celestial event along with one of nature's wonders and if you just uh, come across to where I am to the left You'll see the crowds have been gathering, coming in since early in the morning. You can see them here on the U.S. side and also across on, across on the Canadian side. Very much a kind of picnic-like atmosphere at this state park. Uh, people not getting too down about the weather, remaining optimistic, fingers crossed, nevertheless telling me that no matter what happens, they will live in this moment and enjoy it. Uh, but we have some concerts going on, uh, people just with their families who have taken off, have traveled from as far as overseas, surrounding states, here to enjoy the moment. Uh, Neda, uh, for the moment, we will be back there, of course, in a little while. Thank you very much, and thanks to all our correspondents uh, in those locations in Mexico and uh, across the U.S. Around the world and across the U.K., you're watching BBC News.
You're watching The World Today at BBC News. I'm Anita McVeigh, and we are building up to the total eclipse, the total solar eclipse that we've been telling you about today. Um, uh, people in the US in particular will be getting an amazing view uh, in a number of states, 13 states in total. The um, Cook Islands in the Pacific will be the first place to experience that uh, totality, that point where um, it's plunged from daytime into darkness, then moving across into Mexico, uh, across those 13 states in the US, and then up towards Canada. Um, so lots of amazing images. Um, this image is coming to us from Mexico right now. So we now have that moment where the sun appears as a crescent. And also pictures from Arkansas as well. So we'll keep an eye on these really awe-inspiring images that are coming into us um, with me. A perfect person to talk about them, Edward Bloomer, Senior Astronomy Manager at the Royal Observatory. Edward, thank you very much for staying with me in the studio. So just explain for our viewers, if you would, about these different phases of the eclipse approaching totality. So um, because the moon is essentially moving into the way of the sun, uh, we have the first point of contact where the we'll talk about, say, the moon's surface, right? The, the moon's surface appears to touch the sun's surface. Then it moves across. If you're in the right position, it will move in such a way that it will completely cover up the sun, so, uh, so you get that moment of totality. But if you're not in quite the right position, um, then the, the moon will essentially sort of skim past it or kind of graze uh, the sun. Uh, once, once you have achieved totality, if, if you're in the right position, of course, the moon has to then leave if you like it has to move out of the way and so you get a last point of contact uh, as well where the moon has just moved out of the way and then it's no longer blocking the sun at all mm. uh, and we heard from will grant in mexico that they're going to get about 75 80 percent totality which is still going to be quite a dramatic effect isn't it that was in mexico city elsewhere in the country they will get that complete totality yes absolutely so there's a, there's a thin path it's, a, it's about 100 miles across um, yeah I was just about to ask you how wide this path of totality is typically it, it varies over the course of it because you're essentially sort of projecting a shadow onto the sphere of, of, of the earth so it, it does change but it's a it's roughly let's say about about 100 100 miles uh, across and that's where you can see totality once you move away from that you see less and less or more and more partial uh, eclipse. But what that means is actually you've got quite a wide path where you can, you can certainly see something. And that means even for us here in the UK, even though we're not going to get totality, it still grazes the point of, um, well, an OK partial eclipse, just about grazes us just as the sun's going down. OK, and of course, you know, if you're not in one of the prime locations to watch this total solar eclipse, you can stay with us here on BBC News because we are bringing you these absolutely stunning images uh, of that eclipse as it makes its way uh, from the, the Cook Islands through Mexico and then will work its way up through those 13 US states we mentioned earlier on its way to uh, Canada. And it's exciting that it's happening, isn't it, Edward, over such densely populated areas for the large part? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it means that so many people are going to get a chance uh, to see it. And, and of course, um, moving over land as it does, it also means you can, or people have been setting up cameras. So it's going to be very well recorded uh, as well as just observed um, in the moment. And just take us through again as we continue to watch these pictures, you know, what are the key things that scientists will be looking to learn from this eclipse? So with this eclipse, uh, we're going to be certainly looking at the, the outer atmosphere of the sun um, uh, during that moment of, of, of totality, in fact, even leading uh, up to that. There are also efforts to uh, uh, observe what's happening in the ionosphere uh, of, of uh, the Earth itself. So the, I the ionosphere being... Oh, the, in, in the atmosphere of the, 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 the Earth itself, uh, and so the effect that it actually has on us. So in a sense, nothing to do with astronomy, although it is to do with astronomy. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of ground-based stuff happening as well. And there's lots of um, uh, sort of uh, biology science uh, going on as well. People are, are very interested in the effect it has on uh, wildlife and, and sort of the natural environment. OK, Edward, you're staying with me, I believe. Sure. But thank you very much for the moment. So uh, more amazing pictures coming into us. Uh, these taken from Oklahoma where you can see the moon is moving now between the sun and the earth starting to create that 
move, that move, that moment uh, of almost totality. It will happen soon there. Even closer in this picture where the sun appears just as a crescent. Do stay with us here on The World Today to watch this total solar eclipse. Hello. Monday brought us a bit of mix of weather types. While some of us had some spells of a warm spring sunshine, other areas were stuck under the cloud and rain all day. It's been a really wet first week of April and that unsettled theme continues for the next few days. So more blustery spells of rain at times and it's turning a little bit cooler than it has been too. So we've got low pressure driving our weather at the moment. Here it is. It's gradually easing its way eastwards through the rest of this evening, overnight and over the next 24 hours or so. It'll bring us some more wet and windy weather. Some thunderstorms initially for the far southeast, East Anglia. They clear northwards and then the bulk of the rain through tonight will be Northern Ireland, Scotland, perhaps western parts of England and Wales. Across Scotland, in fact, we could see some flooding by dawn because that rain is falling on very saturated ground. It's not going to be a cold night, six to nine degrees, but it is going to be windy for many of us, particularly down towards the southwest of England, through the English Channel, through the North Channel as well. More of this rain for Tuesday lingering for Scotland, parts of northern England in particular as well, followed by sunshine and a few blustery showers from the west. Driest for parts of southern England through the day, but gusts of wind, 45 miles per hour or so in land but stronger than that gales around some of the coastal regions and we've got really high tides with a full moon at the moment so we could be seeing some coastal flooding as well top temperatures 8 to 12 on tuesday so cooler than recent days especially so when you add on the wind chill so the blue colors the colder air mass with us for a time through the middle part of the week but later on wednesday and the next warm front moves in from the atlantic bringing some warmer air and some rain too. Could be an early frost in the east, I think, on Wednesday, but the cloud increases, the rain moves its way in, and the winds are going to be picking up through the day as well. So another unsettled day, more fairly unwelcome rain for some of us, heaviest in the northwest. Temperatures about 10 to 15 for most of us, so just starting to edge up, certainly compared to Tuesday. And then we've got this lingering front. We're heading into Thursday now. I don't think there'll be too much rain on that, but there's likely to be quite a lot of low cloud mist and murk around some southern hills and coasts, for instance, first thing on Thursday. Bright the skies from the word go towards the north and I think through the day the sunshine should tend to break up that cloud. So a bit of a drier, brighter sort of day for many of us and a touch warmer. We're looking at highs in Norwich and London up to about 19 degrees or so. 20 Celsius possible in the south for Friday and Saturday. Then things turn cooler and more unsettled into next week. The world of film is changing faster and faster all the time. I've been reporting on cinema for more than 40 years. So what's it like to be an Oscar nominee? Our global talking movies team... How does that work on set? ...brings you up to date on the latest in movie making from around the world. Looking at stories from other cultures. Interviewing top filmmakers and stars. People seem to be emotionally charged by the film. From blockbusters to art house cinema, we'll spotlight the brilliant and unique voices bringing their stories to the big screen. Talking Movies. Watch on BBC iPlayer. The day's most important stories. Sent every weekday direct to your inbox. Get the news you need to know and understand what it means for you. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash news daily and sign up now. And welcome to The World Today from the BBC. We're bringing you live coverage of the total solar eclipse over North America. Let's bring you these live pictures straight away. Millions of people are uh, in the midst of experiencing this solar eclipse, uh, approaching that moment of totality when the face of the sun is totally obscured by the moon moving between the sun and the earth. These pictures from Oklahoma 
And coming up, some live pictures from Mexico, where all that is uh, left visible of the sun at the moment is that slim crescent. So very close to totality there. Millions of people uh, watching this along the route of totality, the path of totality, as it's called, when daytime is plunged into darkness. And it lasts for four minutes and nine seconds. So totality, as you saw just moments away uh, in Mexico, we can cross to my colleague, Helena Humphrey, presenter of BBC World News America, who is at Avon Lake in Ohio. A big watch party there. You were telling us a little earlier, Helena, and a huge sense, sense of anticipation. Absolutely, and I've just been reliably informed that we are now starting to see the eclipse creep here on Ohio in Avon Lake. Of course, uh, we're some time out from totality here, uh, but we now know uh, that gradually we are now starting on that path, of course, which has gone from Mexico to Canada uh, here in the United States as well. But talking about this watch party, really a buzzing sense of anticipation, one I think that's only grown stronger because... We've all been obsessively watching the weather, I think it's fair to say, ever since we got this assignment in recent weeks. It wasn't looking great at all times, but, you know, taking a look at the picture behind me right now, you can see a beautiful blue sky here on Lake Erie. Could we be in for one of the best seats in the house here in the United States? It remains to be seen, but of course, I think Ohio definitely deserves one. It last saw a total eclipse back in 1806. It won't be seeing another one for another 400 years. I mean, I've been speaking to people here. Uh, one NASA engineer telling me that, you know, he drove in last night, he's been sleeping in his car. There's that sense of si excitement around science, an emotional element, some people even calling it a spiritual experience. But I believe that we can go now to Palab Ghosh, our science correspondent in the newsroom there in London. Palab, great to have you with us following this eclipse. It is a big day, isn't it, for the science community? It is. And those pictures from Mexico, the moment of totality coming, we're in for an incredible treat. And that moment will sweep all across Mexico. United States uh, and uh, Canada giving one of the most spectacular natural events that you could uh, wish to see. The first thing you'll see is what's called Bailey's beads when the last chink of light starts to disappear and you see what looks like a, a string of beads uh, along the, the, the moon surface. Then the final chink becomes much brighter. It looks like a diamond ring. And then the moment we've all been waiting for, totality. This is so special because the moon is exactly the right size to block the bright part of the sun so you can see the sun's atmosphere. Something that's usually invisible, but we can see it in its full glory. And it's especially interesting at the moment because the sun is at one of its solar peaks. So there should be lots of activity going on. Look for the little red what they're called prominences, like tiny mountains, but they're actually gigantic nuclear explosions, some of them as big as the Earth itself. And you can watch that if you're there for a full four and a half minutes. So that's an incredible uh, experience for anyone lucky enough to see it. But even if you can't see it, if there are clouds, you will notice a sudden drop in the light, uh, drop in the temperature, and all of a sudden, the animals suddenly become very, very quiet. That's right. And, and I know that scientists will be studying this moment closely, won't they, uh, when it comes to animals, also humans. But just tell us about what they're hoping to learn from this particular solar eclipse. Well, to be honest, there'll be no Nobel Prizes won by witnessing the total eclipse because these eclipses have gone on just as long as there have been a sun, a moon and an earth and of course more recently when scientists have been able to observe it. So there's a lot of data that has been collected that can be collected. Uh, it's more a case of getting the public interest in science looking at that corona, the sun's atmosphere, when you can hardly ever see it. Data uh, uh, readings will be taken, they will be noted, but it's more for the experience and the the personal experience I, I, I saw earlier you were suggesting to people 
don't pay too much attention in taking pictures, uh, trying to kind of uh, record it for posterity. Just live the moment because it is, truly is a once in a lifetime experience. Well, Paula, talking about uh, living the moment, let's go over to Mexico now because uh, Mexico is in totality. Here we can hear that wonderful moment. Let's take a look. magical moment of totality that magical moment of totality there in Mexico you can hear the cheers ringing out we'll be watching and waiting for similar cheers here in Ohio in just over an hour's time when we go into totality as well but certainly a moment I think it's very exciting, a historical moment, one that'll go down in the history books that kind of gives you goosebumps even for me just listening to it. And I know that my colleague, science correspondent Palab Ghosh, is also watching those images with me in London. We're connected right around the world for this a moment of the great eclipse. And Palab, watching that, listening to those cheers, it's kind of a good reminder when I was speaking to scientists that many of them are saying that even going beyond uh, the cosmic element of this, uh, the astronomy of all of this. You know, NASA engineers have been telling me that at the end of the day, a great eclipse is also a very magical event, something that almost seems transcendent, uh, provokes often an, an emotional response, as we just heard there from people. Transcendent is absolutely the right word because all of a sudden, what we take uh, as normal is suddenly changed for a moment. We saw in those incredible pictures that diamond ring and what we can see now, which we'll be able to see for the next few minutes. So, so these are precious moments. Just gaze at that picture of the halo, the aura uh, surrounding the, the moon. It, it, I've been lucky enough to see it myself. And when you're there, it looks like a gigantic black pearl shimmering, hanging there. In, in the in the darkened sky. And if you look closely, 
you can see little things that look like flares coming from the sun. There's one just um, at about five o'clock. That's a gigantic nuclear explosion. So there's some science there, which uh, is, uh, you know, interesting, but the main experience is just being totally overwhelmed. You're almost sent into a, a dreamlike state when you're witnessing it. So you, you've got a lot to look forward to when it comes your way. We're very lucky indeed to be witnessing it here, out here in the United States, to witness it, Palab Ghosh watching it with me. Thank you so very much for being with us. Uh, I now uh, know that there in Mexico, what they're witnessing is the ring of fire right now, that corona uh, around the eclipse, which means that it is a very great eclipse indeed for people being able to see it. Also watching it with me, and we can bring in now, is uh, Professor Susie Imber. Uh, professor Susie Imber is a professor of space physics at the University of Leicester. Thank you very much, Susie, for being with us. This must be a really exciting day for you. Yeah, it's amazing, actually, to see these images coming back from Mexico. I'm sad that I'm not there to see it myself, but it's fantastic to know that there are tens of millions of people able to observe this incredible phenomenon. Here in the United States, there was uh, what's being called the Great American Eclipse in 2017. We expect this eclipse to be even bigger. Certainly the path of totality is wider. Just talk to us about how this differs from other total eclipses. Yes, so this particular uh, path, uh, as, as you've been showing uh, on the coverage, is passing over through Mexico, Texas, and up through Maine and, and, and uh, northeastern Canada. Um, and the time that you have totality is longer than it was in 2017. So in 2017, you were looking at maybe a couple of minutes. Now we're looking at about four and a half minutes of totality. So the experience is longer for anyone watching. And of course, that's important because as an observer, if you're in the path of totality, and only if you're in the path of totality, you're able to remove your eclipse glasses and actually look at the phenomenon itself. Um, before putting them on again, just before the, the sun reappears. So that duration is actually pretty important. And talking about that totality and the longer duration there as you were, Susie, for, for animals, for the natural world, this can be pretty confusing, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. Suddenly day has turned into night. Um, and there have been various studies looking at the way that animals respond, particularly to total eclipses, noticing that birds and insects behave differently. They tend to, to land and, and seek shelter. Um, and there are various studies that will be happening during this eclipse as well to try to understand the response of the natural world to this phenomenon. And so what kind of things do you think that scientists will be looking to learn then, not just about the natural world, but also about the sun, uh, the sun's atmosphere as well, particularly if we manage to see the chromosphere? Yeah, so when we have this, this uh, total eclipse, as we've been seeing in the images that you've been broadcasting, you can just about see the atmosphere of the sun. So the solar disk itself is completely obscured and, and you can start to see the particles streaming off the solar surface. You can see some of these features that, that Palab was mentioning earlier, prominences um, that you can't normally uh, observe because the brightness of the sun overwhelms um, overwhelms that, that part. So um, you can start to see some of these features. Um, now, we have spacecraft looking at the sun routinely that do exactly the same thing. They block out the solar disk and we can start to see these features. But what's exciting about this is that we get to connect with the public. We get to share our excitement around space science, our subject. We get to show people space science in action. Um, by, by, by us all being able to look up at the sky and observe this. And so it's not, as, as, as we heard, that we're going to make amazing breakthroughs around solar physics, but it's more that we get to share these images that we see every day as space physicists with the rest of the world. And that's really exciting for us. Now, there is a, a citizen science program that's going on. NASA has an app you can download if you're in the path of totality. And you upload images and videos that you've taken to try to tell us a little bit about the shape of the sun. So we think of it as being um, a, a perfect circle, but it isn't. 
uh, it's a slightly squashed circle. And by uploading images um, taken by people all along the path of totality, we're hoping that scientists will be able to get a better understanding uh, of this. Um, so there is some interesting science happening just through taking lots of images of the solar surface uh, as this eclipse happens. All right, Professor Susie Imber, I don't think science gets much cooler than that, really. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. Well, we, we can go over now to Mexico and speak to our correspondent, Will Grant. Will, I understand where you are, dusk-like conditions right now. Just bring us up to date with what it feels like there right now, the atmosphere. Well, it was just wonderful, wasn't it, to hear those whoops and the, the, those cheers of excitement as totality hit uh, Mazatlan on the coast of Sinaloa. Um, all those people who'd made the journey and made the effort to be there to mark this occasion, to, to see this uh, total eclipse as it makes its way across the North American continent, starting exactly where they were. That was a really exciting and very touching moment for them, really. Um, here in the capital, uh, it is exactly like, as you say, it's sort of kind of as though we're approaching dusk or something, a slightly eerie, eerie feel to the city. Um, one wonders if it's going to get darker still or if that's the moment uh, as is, as much as uh, the, the, the residents of Mexico City will see. Um, but either way, there's a sense in which something unique is happening in Mexico today and the Mexicans are uh, among the lucky ones to be able to see it, even if it's just partial as opposed to along the full line of totality that's going to make its way up through Durango to the north, into Texas, through the United States and up to Canada. What an extraordinary moment and what a fantastic thing for children as well in the schools to be able to to check out with their teachers or with their families, those who have stayed at home to watch it. There are people on different rooftops around me who are having little um, viewing parties or sitting in deck chairs looking at this uh, uh, experience through the special sunglasses um, and it, it, it sort of clearly captured the imagination. I know at the university here in Mexico City there's a very large viewing party taking place there. It sounds utterly beautiful, uh, Will, I do have to say, but, you know, here in Ohio as well, I do have to say school's out for many kids as well. But talking about this being, you know, an educational experience as well, you were mentioning that there in Mexico. And when it comes to um, astronomy and mathematics and being able to predict this, that is something that Mexico has a strong history in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it can only take one event to, to inspire people, can't it? And so something like this really might help uh, inspire a, a new generation of Mexican astronomers and scientists and, and mathematicians. Who knows? Certainly, though, Mexico has an incredible history in all of that. I mean, not just in the modern era um, where, you know, the university system here is very strong in terms of its focus on science, particularly in North uh, Monterrey, for example, but, um, but historically. Uh, the entire culture is built around the understanding of Mexico, Mexico's place in the universe. Um, uh, in the ancient Maya and the Aztecs really um, were cultures that gazed upon the skies and, under, and understood their, um, their, 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 their meaning really uh, and their positions in, in the world in those terms. They were, they were astronomers, uh, astronomers and, and accomplished mathematicians built their structures, built their temples uh, around the stars and, and, and the constellations. So yeah, there is this sort of romantic connection to all of that too. But I think really in terms of today, it's much more about living this experience. There will be people who will have made the effort to, to move from wherever they are in the territory of the Republic of Mexico to be in Sinaloa today, to be on the beaches in uh, 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 Mazatlan uh, and, and to be the very first to to experience totality of the, uh, the total eclipse uh, as it makes its way north. As you say, Will, truly a once in a lifetime experience for so many of us. Great to talk to you, Will Grant, there in Mexico. Uh, Mexico just about 10 minutes out now from totality. And as we await that moment, we can cross back over to our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, who is watching it all with me. Um, Palab, just talking about the science, I mean, not necessarily cosmic coincidences here, but just in terms of how eclipses work, uh, is the case when it comes to solar eclipses, isn't it, that in fact the moon is 400 times smaller 
than the Earth, but because it's 400 times closer to us, it all neatly lines up and we get that moment of eclipse. Cosmic coincidence is exactly the right word. It's uncanny. If uh, the moon was any smaller, uh, the light would pass uh, past it and we wouldn't see the atmosphere. If it was any larger, uh, we wouldn't be able to see the atmosphere. So it's an incredible coincidence that we can see it. And those whoops and cheers we heard in Mexico are speeding, literally at the speed of sound, across the continent of North America, headed on its way to Texas, where there'll be more whoops and cheers, almost like a, a Mexican wave, for want of a better word. And that experience will be spread all across uh, the whole of the continental uh, of, of North America, something very much to look forward to. And for those who can't experience the, the totality, someone said to me that a partial eclipse is interesting. You can watch the um, sun having a bite taken out of it uh, through solar uh, eclipse glasses, uh, I hasten to add. But seeing a, even if 1% of the sun's light gets through, you can't see the corona. Someone said to me that it's a bit like going to a football match but not going in to see the game. What the game is, is that beautiful corona. And it, as you said earlier, described it so beautifully, it is a transcendent experience. It's almost, it is like being in a waking dream. And once that moment of totality has passed, you're still feeling quite in, 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 a, in an incredible high, which lasts with you for hours, if not days. And just talking about that high and what scientists will be looking at, they'll also be studying human behaviour, won't they? There's a lot that's unknown. Um, I read one study that in 2017, uh, here in the United States, taking a look at data uh, from X, for example, Twitter, at the time, it found that people who were in the path of totality were more likely to use the pronoun we as opposed to I and express for con concern for others around them. You know, it's interesting, all of these unknowns with regards to the eclipse. Well, if there is something innate about eclipses because they have gone on for as long as there have been human beings. So just imagine what our ancestors thought when unexpectedly there was a, an eclipse. The, the, the light that they were used to had, had gone. So, and even now, when we know exactly what's going on, it, a, a, f a switch flicks in your mind. You're, you're in that dreamlike moment. And so you're different, perhaps, in, in a higher state of mind, dare I say. And so there's a lot of psychological work that can be done if you, if you want to, but far better just to see the experience, absorb it, and let it wash over you, and you haven't got long to go yourself to witness that. Absolutely, uh, Palev. I'm looking to find the one person here in the United States who hadn't got the memo, hadn't heard the hype about the eclipse, didn't know it was happening, and wonders, like our ancestors, what on earth is happening right now. It is starting to get a little bit darker, I almost feel, uh, like right here in Ohio. But let's take a look now at the pictures in Oklahoma as that eclipse starts to make its way across the United States. Yes, ma'am. One second, I'll, I'll reframe it. You can take a closer look. Well, it is just a few minutes away there in Oklahoma before we get to totality. It'll be coming up in around four minutes' time there in Oklahoma. Then we'll start to see it creep its way to Ohio where we are. Uh, we're expecting over four minutes if we are lucky in the path of totality of darkness. That is considerably longer than what we heard in 2017. I can just hear a few people there saying, oh wow, in Oklahoma. And I expect that we'll be uh, in for some uh, similar comments here in Ohio. Usually what we see is people uh, start to cheer in totality. Of course, that is the moment when we can take our glasses off for that briefest of moments. Uh, we were hearing from one uh, NASA employee previously who said that uh, it is just a moment not only to look at the sky but just to take in the surroundings and see how your fellow eclipse 
watchers are reacting as well. Now we can go over to Angelica Casa, who is in uh, Texas, joining us now. Uh, Angelica, there in Eagle Pass, Texas. What is the latest? What are you seeing there, Angelica? Hi, so we are starting to see the sky become a little bit dark. It's still not yet totally here, and we also have a lot of clouds. But families have gathered at a sports complex, and everybody's already looking up with their glasses on. So we're definitely anticipating it to happen in just a couple of minutes. And I just wonder if you're noticing any changes there, whether it is the sounds of animals, uh, birds, for example, whether it's starting to feel colder. Can you feel the difference? Yes, we definitely feel a gust of wind coming through that wasn't here even five, ten minutes ago. Um, the sky is turning a dark, dark gray. I think it looks like it could easily be right, you know, at dusk right now, but it's not. Of course, it's daytime. Um, and there's, I mostly really hear actually children because that's what's around me and they're very excited. Um, so I, I'm not hearing yet animals, but I do hear the noises of excited children looking up through their glasses and yelling at their parents. I see the sun. I see the sun. Um, so we're just now literally, you know, a minute or two away from it becoming nighttime here. And tell me more about how people are watching this. Do they have uh, obviously glasses, but, you know, specially rigged telescopes, for example, any kind of homemade devices? I've met with so many people that have brought out their cameras with long lenses and they've bought, bought special equipment to be able to view the eclipse through it with it. Um, they've, there's people out here with telescopes that are very expensive, but, you know, for some people it's a hobby to follow eclipses and, you know, they've, been, they, they, they've uh, you know, bought this expensive equipment to be here today. Um, so it's a lot of different uh, equipment, but also just everybody here with their glasses and kids, as I tell you, um, cheering right now as we're starting to see the sky become darker. Angelica, you know, as well as I do, we live in a very online connected world. We seem to always be attached to our phones these days. I just wonder if you're noticing people putting away their phones, kind of a feeling of connection, people coming together to enjoy this eclipse. Yes, definitely. I mean, people, they, some of them have their phone because they're taking photos of what's happening. Um, but for the most part, people are looking up, they're together, they've come together, people from miles away, some of them who flew into Eagle Pass to this area. Um, I think I've met more internationals and people from out of state than I've met locals here. Um, and it's just a, a really nice event and make, makes everybody feel connected. Angelica, very good to talk to you there in Eagle Pass, Texas. I hope you relish and enjoy and take in that moment of totality with everyone there. Great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Well, we can now go over Thank to you. Edward Bloomer. He is a senior uh, astro astronomy manager at the Royal Observatory in our studios there in London, keeping us company through this great solar eclipse. Great to have you with us, Edward. What does this day mean to you? It must be a huge day for you and, and in the world of astronomy. Well, it's very exciting. I mean, uh, I'm very interested in science communication, public engagement. So the fact that so many people are going to be able to, to witness this from themselves, I think is very special. It helps spread uh, the, the correct message about the importance of astronomy uh, and, and, and raise the interest in science. Um, so it's, it's very important, I think. And so when we have that moment of totality, four and a half minutes, if we're lucky, we're hoping for here in Ohio. It won't just be the corona potentially that we're looking for either. There's also the potential to see other stars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, that's right. And there's a historical precedent for, for that being very important. Um, being able to witness the, the stars in, the, in, in an altered position, that the starlight um, literally coming to you at a slightly different angle because of the presence of the sun, uh, was very important for uh, proving uh, the uh, general theory of relativity. Uh, um, there was a, an expedition in 1919 uh, that was set up specifically to, to do that. Um, so actually, yeah, uh, observing the stars at, uh, uh, in the day uh, has historically been very, very important for understanding the universe. That's really interesting. Tell us more about the historical importance of eclipses over the ages. Um, so we've, we've learned lots of things at different times, but, but certainly in 1919, um, Relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity was sort of the, the, the new, great, cool thing on the block. Uh, but uh, it wasn't 
it wasn't definitely true. We didn't absolutely know that. And one of the ways uh, that um, we could test it um, was that it predicted a different deflection of light uh, compared to, say, Newtonian gravity. So um, lots of people have been using <laughs> Newtonian gravity for, for a couple of hundred years, um, and Einstein's uh, predictions were different. Um, now, one way to test that would be to look at the position of some known stars uh, during the moment of eclipse, because you'd be able to see the stars uh, without the sunlight blocking it, but the, the way that the light was coming in would be deflected by the mass of the sun itself, the light itself deflected by the sun. Um, so knowing their position very, very uh, accurately and knowing how they appeared in the pictures they were trying to take uh, would uh, allow us to work out whether, well, is Einstein right or is Newton uh, correct? And it turns out Einstein is correct. Fascinating insights there. Edward Bloomer, great to have you with us. Thanks so much. Well, we can now go over to our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, who is in Texas. Nomia, bring us up to date with the latest. How's the weather looking? How's the eclipse progressing? So, Helen, it's gone a bit cold, which means it's getting getting to that point. It's gone darker as well. I've got my uh, safe sunglasses on and if you don't mind, I'm just looking. So an hour ago, I, I said that it looked like uh, the, the moon had nibbled the sun, but now it's really eaten its way in. It's like a crescent and people are just getting so excited. There were loads of cheers. I'm actually in this, um, this uh, camping park. Uh, and there are up to, there are said to be up to 3,000 people here, but if families are here, I don't know if you can uh, just see here camping with their children, all with their camera phones as well. And those phones do have filters on them, and people just staring at the sky, waiting for that moment of to totality, which is due to happen in about eight minutes' time. And we will get up to four minutes of darkness, which is quite a long time. So people are just, just ready for it now. Well, Nomi, I'm crossing my fingers for you to make sure that you get the over four minutes of hard-earned totality traveling all the way there to Texas. We also know now that in Eagle Pass, uh, where we were just speaking to Angelica, they are now officially in totality. So it is, of course, as you say, Nomi, coming your way. But you were just mentioning uh, those families uh, that are there that are camping. People have traveled an awful long way, haven't they, here in the United States, Nomia, to be able to witness this moment of history. You know, we, you were covering the Super Bowl. This feels like Super Bowl times, I don't know, 10. That's such a good comparison, actually, with the Super Bowl. And yeah, you have people who've been planning this for some time. But I also met an astrophysicist who's on a sabbatical, and he decided, right, I'm just going to pack pack my stuff in a car and come last minute and he is actually in the park all ready to watch the solar eclipse. Uh, just an hour ago I also spoke to this lady uh, who has come from Germany. She's a self-described total eclipse chaser so this is her fourth time. She's here to see her best friend who's American and this is her first time so it was really sweet. There was sort of she said, I'm going to guide her on, on, on um, how to ex enjoy the experience. I did say something controversial. I mentioned the weather. It is the, the curveball. It's quite cloudy at the moment. We are all praying that those clouds clear. Uh, but uh, one of the ladies said to me, she is in no doubt that it's going to be perfect. So we've got about six minutes for it to be perfect, Helena, so we can see that amazing corona. Well, I've got my fingers crossed for you. I do have to say, with the BBC, we're used to discussing weather. We can deal with anything, uh, I think <laughs> it has to be said. But just coming back to that point, I mean, you mentioned there somebody travelled all the way from Germany. It's been a big economic boom for the United States, hasn't it? You know, traffic jams, hotels booked out, flights booked out. Yes, everything is almost five times, ten times as much exp as expensive as it was before. People are really utilising the opportunity. Uh, just even, I, I did see on social media, I should say, I'm not sure how accurate it was, but I can believe it was, um, this, this map of America and that path of totality which crosses through the three countries of North America, but uh, through the heartlands of America. Uh, it was just 
so dotted in terms of all the hotels that have been booked out. Uh, so this is a huge uh, economic boom, uh, particularly here. This, you know, this park is a very historic park. It's open to the public. I don't think they're charging much for people to be here. Uh, but as well as the economic boom, there is this uh, there is this total community feel about it. Everyone is so unified and excited to experience uh, what we know and what has been described as this once in a lifetime opportunity. Absolutely. There is something quite egalitarian about it, isn't it, compared to Super Bowl tickets, for example, uh, Taylor Swift tickets. This is a natural phenomenon, something we can just step outside and, of course, with the right eye gear, just take a look at. Uh, Nomi, I do just want to ask on a personal note. I mean, have you ever seen a total solar eclipse before? Uh, what are you most looking forward to? I've never seen one before, so this is like I'm. Uh, this is a professional thing, but it's also a personal thing. It's really, really exciting. And one of the things that I keep asking those who have seen it is, describe it. What is it like? And they all say to me, it's indescribable. It's hard to articulate. But one thing they do also say is, it's not just a visual thing. Of course, you want to see that the corona, you want to see the diamond, you want to see all the different phases. But it's a multi-sensory experience, as we've been hearing uh, throughout uh, on BBC News today. It's about the temperatures dropping. It's about being in full darkness and having uh, your, your personal moment with that. It's about animals, nocturnal animals. It's about everything. And so that's, that's what people are saying. I've also been advised uh, by an astrophysicist that I just mentioned who's here. He said, put down your phone. Just enjoy it. It's so tempting to get your phone out. I mean, I'm guilty of doing it. You should have a solar filter on it. But he said, just put your foot, foot, phone down and just enjoy the four minutes of uh, what will be an indescribable experience. Absolutely. I fully intend to take that advice. Nomi Iqbal, I think we have one of the best jobs uh, today for the BBC. Great to talk <laughs> yeah. to you and fully enjoy that moment. Great to talk to you. Well, we can now go over to Anita Day, who's in Maryland here in the United States. She is the Strategic Partnerships Manager for NASA. Anita, great to have you with us. This must be a huge day for NASA. How exciting is it? It's so exciting. All of my colleagues are just thrilled. Many of them are traveling for the eclipse. All of them are talking about the science, but they're also talking about how excited they are to have this experience. Is there anything in particular that they will be looking for in terms of the scientific perspective with this particular eclipse? Absolutely. We have research jets called the WB-57s that are going to fly at about 50,000 feet, so mostly above the Earth's atmosphere. And they're going to be carrying, uh, actually they are, they are already carrying uh, research uh, equipment. Um, they're following the path of totality across Mexico to be able to uh, maximize their time there. So they're going to be looking at the lower and middle corona, that's the atmosphere of the sun, because you don't get as good a fit uh, as you do with, the, uh, with anything else as you do with the moon to be able to see that corona. So they're going to be trying to identify structures within the corona uh, to increase our understanding of the corona, because of course that creates space weather, which is what affects us here on Earth. They're also going to be trying to understand the temperature and the chemical composition of the uh, particles that come off of the sun that, again, affect us here on Earth. And finally, on the uh, airplanes, uh, amateur radio operators are going to have a listening party. They're going to be listening to see how far their communication signals travel in the ionosphere. That's the uppermost layer of the Earth's atmosphere. That's where most of our communications travel. Well, I'm just hearing that we are nearing totality in Texas. We've got about 44 million people here in the United States who will be in the path of totality. We're here in it in Ohio. But Anita, even for those who aren't in the path of totality, we've got about 99 percent of Americans who will have some chance of encountering the eclipse, be it in partial or full form. That's huge, isn't it? It's, it's extremely huge. This is a a life altering experience for some people. I am going to have a partial eclipse. It's, it's just started here in Maryland. It's going to peak in about 40 minutes. I can't wait to go outside and experience this with my children. My, my dad is already here. My mother-in-law, they're sitting on the back porch. 
um, it's a it's a bonding event for your family, for your friends, for your community. The awe that we can experience from this kind of celestial event is invaluable. Anita Day, Strategic Partnerships Manager at NASA there in Maryland. Have a great time going out with your family. Take it all in. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Well, we can go back over now to our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, who is in Texas, who's experiencing, as you can hear, that all-important moment. Nomia, what does it feel like? You've come right on time, Helena. It's happened. I'm going to take my sunglasses off. Wow. Oh, my gosh. People have got their phones out. And it's just amazing. You can see it's like a halo around the sun and the moon. They're aligned and it's now moving through the clouds. And we're in total darkness. It is exactly how everyone has described it to me who have seen it, which is that it's indescribable. I don't know if you can see any, I don't know what you're seeing, if you're seeing that sun and moon moving, but I can tell you what's happening here on the ground in the park. Children just standing up in complete awe. This is a, a, an area where families have come for the night and for the day to watch this, this huge phenomenon. And people are clapping. It's, it's thrilling. It's a really thrilling moment. I'm so glad to hear you there experiencing it uh, in full to totality, hearing people cheering. I just wonder in the atmosphere, apart from the fact that it's gone dark, do you notice any changes? Does it feel colder? It feels much colder. It definitely feels much colder. Um, it feels, it, it's like nighttime. That, that's what it is, isn't it? It's gone from day to night and it's just... Yeah, it's gone really cold. People are in awe. So I, one woman said to me, you'll get two kinds of reaction. You'll get those who will be screaming, who will be in complete awe of it, and those who will sit there quietly and taking it in. And we've definitely got those two types of people here. There are some who are just sat here with their jaws open watching it, knowing that this is... I mean, we are so lucky to be witnessing this. This is an amazing moment. That's not going to happen for another two decades across America. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, as you say, Nomi, a week. <laughs> awesome. You are witnessing a once-in-a-lifetime experience there. Uh, what does it look like? Just describe what you're seeing with the sun right now. So... The sun is like this ball just moving through the sky and it's surrounded by this, uh, this light. It's, it's like a halo. It's a ball with this white halo just drifting through the sky aimlessly. And it was cloudy before, so there were some concerns that we just weren't going to get to see it uh, because it is, it is a multi-sensory experience, but you want to see the corona. You want to see that moment. And, and the weather lucked out for us. Thankfully, people were praying and hoping that would happen and we are getting to see it fully. I wish I could put my phone up and take a picture, but I know it, it won't be a very good picture, basically. Um, and one of the, the pieces of advice I was given by someone who had seen the, the total solar eclipse is just watch it, just experience it, just enjoy it. You don't need to take pictures. There's plenty of pictures, pl better pictures being taken of this moment, uh, but it's a real... Uh, real memorable moments that, uh, yeah, you're not going to forget. And that's certainly the truth here for, for people who are gathered well, here. Everyone's got their phones up, Helena, though. <laughs> well, here you... <laughs> here you are, experiencing that moment, talking to me here in Ohio throughout it all. We do appreciate that, uh, Nomia, but just talking about the magnitude of this moment, I mean, people have come from far and wide, haven't they, to experience it. Just, you know, how many people are where you are right now? Well, there's said to be up to 3,000 people in the park. And when you come through the front entrance, there's a, uh, there's a map of the world and people do put a pin from where they've come from. So, oh, there are people all over America that have come here. Oh, it's now moving, sorry. 
I'm just putting my sunglasses on. We're leaving totality. Wow. It's slowly getting lighter again. Wow. Sorry. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, so that on this felt like a good map, four and a half. That... In... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That was a long time. I was just thinking as broadcasters, we know that's a pretty long time, isn't it? Four and a half minutes. But there is a world map at the front of the, this farm. People are clapping now. And it, people have put pins to show where they're from. You've got people coming from Europe, from the Far East, from all over to witness this very special moment. Well, Namia, thank you so much for spending it with us. Uh, here in Ohio. It will be winding its way to us in less than 30 minutes time in Ohio. That's when we are expecting totality here, hopefully having uh, over four minutes as well if we're lucky. We can go over now to Palab Ghosh, who is watching it all with us from the London newsroom, our science correspondent, who is absolutely in his element today. This is what he goes to work for, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Palab, you just heard there Nomia experiencing what looks to be over four minutes. That is incredibly long, isn't it, compared to other eclipses? It, it, it is, and I'm so pleased for Nomia that the clouds parted, especially for her. And we were able to see this lovely eclipse. What I noticed was it was so, you could see so much of the sun's atmosphere. You can see it now just expanding so far beyond the moon. And that's because this eclipse is better than most because the sun's activity is much greater. So there's a lot more going on and you can see the atmosphere so much more. Um, and uh, the, you could just tell from the reaction of those uh, around Nomia that they felt the same as well. And I bet you can't wait yourself to experience it for yourself. I can't, Pala, but I do have to say it is gradually starting to feel a little bit cooler, I think, uh, a little bit more uh, grey here. But just in terms of, you know, how lucky we are to be witnessing this great uh, eclipse and the fact that it's contiguous here in the United States, so going right across the United States, Mexico, Canada as well. Just talk to us about how rare that is, because actually... If I'm not mistaken, of course, you're the science correspondent. Eclipses do happen fairly often. But in terms of it being a great solar eclipse contiguously across the United States, that is the rarity. Yes, they do happen um, every 18 months or so. Quite a lot of it happens over the sea. And of course, North America being such a large continent means that so many more people will be able to, to watch it. And that is something that makes eclipses special just people being able to, uh, to, to, to enjoy it. Um, but also what uh, makes this eclipse special is, as I say, the sun's activity is at its height and also people are able to experience it for four minutes or more, as, as we um, saw in, in Texas. Quite often those moments of totality can be as little as 30 seconds or so, so that is an incredible experience to experience it for that length of time. But whether it's 30 seconds or four and a half minutes, it's still going to be something that will live with you for the rest of your life. I've managed to see three, um, and I plan to see a few more uh, for as long as I can. Absolutely. I, I managed to see one in Austria in 1999. Uh, that was also there in the UK as well, and I can attest to the fact that it was a truly magical experience. I remember uh, the birds stopping chirping, thinking that their day's work had been done for the day. The crickets then uh, picking up where they left off and just the sense that it was complete nightfall, uh, the natural world completely confused by it all. But I just want to go back to something you said about the sun's activity being at its high point and this making it a particularly special eclipse. I understand that there are cycles, solar cycles, around every 11 years or so, so we are seeing one once again. Just tell us about how important that is. Well, the sun uh, waxes and wanes. It has high periods of high activity and much lower activity. When the activity is low, you still see quite a spectacular sight. But when there's a lot more going on um, uh, around the sun, you can see 
eclipses like the one that's uh, on our screen right now. Just look how far, it suddenly disappeared, but just look how far it stretches uh, be beyond the moon. And when the um, eclipse approaches uh, you, Helena, just uh, take a look at uh, the, the bands of shadows that might be coming. They'll be whirling towards you at thousands of miles an hour, so that feels pretty weird. The temperature will drop, and the, obviously the skies will darken. They probably have been darkening over the past few minutes, but then all of a sudden they fall off a cliff, and you, you'll be taken by, even though you've seen one before, you'll be just taken by surprise, and you, you may even find it hard to let the words come out because it is just so overwhelming. And I found that I had to do a live commentary during the eclipse that I saw, and I just felt like just being quiet and watching it, but that would have been cheating the viewers and uh, BBC News uh, audiences if I, if I decide to enjoy it rather than comment on it. But sometimes it is worth taking a moment, seeing those pictures about the wonder of what's happening in, in the heavens. Absolutely. Expert advice there and analysis from our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. And I can attest to what he's saying. It is starting to feel distinctly chillier here in Ohio now. Where He was mentioning the shadows. I was just taking a look at them as he was speaking. And indeed, I am starting to see uh, more shadows as they start to barrel towards us as the eclipse approaches us here in Ohio. But of course, we can go back over now to Nomia Iqbal, who just lived that moment of history in Texas. She experienced that moment of totality and she's been soaking in the atmosphere, speaking to people there. Nomia. Was that funny? Hi, Helena. Yes, uh, it was such a historic moment and I experienced it with lots of people, including Sam and Nia and their lovely, gorgeous kids. How was that for you? It was amazing. It was yeah. so incredible. This guy over here was like, Hooping and hollering, it was so cool. <laughs> what was that you? <laughs> that was me, yeah. Yeah, my head is throbbing because that was just so incredibly exciting. Like, it uh, to me, it was just like God's glory on display. Like the fine tuning argument, or if you heard of that, but you got to see that in live motion, like how finely tuned the universe is. Nice. It's, it was just perfect. Like the light or the corona. The way it was moving. Yes. Oh, oh my gosh, my head is hurting because it's just so, I'm still so excited about it. Do you, do you see it as a spiritual moment yes, in that respect? Yes, definitely. It was a definitely a spiritual moment for me. I just wanted to worship the Lord in that moment. And when they put the American song, I was like, man, let's put some worship music on. <laughs> what about you, ladies? How did you find it? Yes, I thought that was very cool. Yeah. You couldn't believe your eyes, could you? No, that was awesome. Were you worried about the weather? I was worried about the weather. A little bit, but it was just so nice. It was perfect. Like, such a great day to have all the kids out. It was really We're so lucky, really no calm. clouds. Yeah. What's your name? I was so excited and I almost cried. You know, I felt a bit teary as well. Why did you want to cry? Because it was just so amazing. I don't know why. It's indescribable, right? Oh, it really it's is. It's such a beautiful thing. What about you? How did you find it? Oh, uh, I thought it was really cool. I also almost cried. <laughs> what I love about this, and I've been, I've been saying this in our coverage, is that you've got families that are here. It's not like you've had to drag your children here, right? Everyone oh, wants no. to be here yep. and really enjoy this moment. Exactly, yeah. We just came 10 minutes away. We were so lucky because last time we watched it was 10 hours away, and we drove to see it 10 hours away. And literally, we're right up the road this time, so it was just so awesome. Yeah. And the They're homeschooled, too, so this is like class for them. And who's teaching them? This is teacher. Oh, well, he's been the teacher today, though. But yeah, yeah, I guess I'm so. normally the teacher. So and, but, but that's the thing, isn't it? There's the, the science aspect of it, and it's making it enjoyable and inclusive for everybody. Exactly, yeah. It's a free, you know, free show, the best show in the world. What I loved about it as well, um, I don't know if this is how you felt, it's not just what you visually see, it's everything around you, it's the way it goes dark as well and the temperature drops. Yeah, it's also just like it makes everybody kind of feel the same way. It kind of brings us all together in that moment, you know, because we're all just like looking at this thing that's just like completely outside of all of us and we're just all trying to understand it all, all together. Yeah. As, yeah. That's a really cool I moment. did meet a self-described uh, solar eclipse chaser, and I oh, think wow. I understand how they feel. Like, it's, uh, you want to do it again and again. I guess it's kind of like tornado chasing. Yeah. Maybe I should pick that up. <laughs> yeah, you just that's don't so want to be in. 
Um, and um, the next one, I think, is in about 20 years' time in, a, in America. America. Oh. I'm not 100% sure about that. We'll have to check that. It's like 2044, the next yeah, one. That kind of thing. So um, I'm really glad you enjoyed yourselves. It's really, really, it's such an amazing experience with everybody here. I'm not quite sure how many people are here right now, but um, yeah. Very happy uh, solar eclipse watchers here in Texas. Uh, this farm, I think, is about more than 600 acres, so uh, there's plenty of room for everyone. And I mentioned before when we were here, it's like this fun family music festival, uh, but the big star here was obviously the sun, and we all got to, to see exactly what we wanted to. Nomi, I think you sound like you've caught the eclipse chase. Nomi, I think you sound like you've caught the eclipse chasing bug. Um, I do expect to see you at the next one, whenever that may be. It sounds like an utterly fantastic day, an unofficial public holiday, if you would, here in parts of America that are experiencing totality right now. Uh, great to talk to you, Nomia. We can now go back over to Susie Imber, Professor of Space Physics at the University of Leicester. Susie, I know that you will have been avidly watching all of the images of the eclipse right around the world. Um, with your space professor hat on, what would make this a truly great, memorable eclipse? Yeah, I have been watching all of the amazing footage that, that we've been seeing, actually. And, and in, in a few images that you showed just a couple of minutes ago, we saw some sort of bright spots around the sun. Um, these, are, these are prominences or filaments. They're bits of the sun's magnetic field, big loops containing lots of hot plasma that we can see with our own eyes during an eclipse. Now, we have spacecraft observing these things all the time, but to be able to see it with your own eyes is, is fantastic. And actually... These filaments or prominences have a big impact on the Earth. If, if they are released in a, in a big cloud of magnetic field and gas, and plasma, and that comes out towards the Earth, it can cause big space weather events for us. So we're really interested in these features. And it's just fantastic to be able to share this because as space scientists, we look at these images all the time with our own fleet of spacecraft. But for everyone else to be able to see this with their own eyes is, is really special. This must be a huge moment, as you say, for your community, particularly in education, when you want to get people infused about this topic. Today is the big day, really, when it comes to education in this field, I imagine. Yeah, it really is. And even though we can't see it in the UK, I mean, there's a chance that you might be able to see a partial eclipse from some areas of the UK, um, but it's, it's pretty cloudy here. Even though we can't see it ourselves, millions, hundreds of millions of people from around the world will see these images and maybe it will spark some interest in planetary science, in space physics, in how the sun interacts with the planets in our solar system, what, what the impact is for us here on the Earth. So it's not often that we get to share our passion for our field with so many people and that makes it really special for us. Professor Susie Imber, you've definitely got me here hooked on eclipses. <laughs> Great to talk to you as ever. Thanks so much. Thank you. We can now go over to Palab Ghosh one last time, our science correspondent. Palab, ultimately, what does this day mean for you? What do these kind of celestial events mean to you personally as a scientist? I think uh, what it means is more what the family said to Nomia rather than what the scientists have to say. The, the, they talked about spirituality, they talked about togetherness, and also the overwhelming beauty of nature. And of course, it does get people interested in science because you need the science to make sense of it all. But uh, the, the key thing is, just look at those images. Just look at that diamond ring beginning to form as the, the last chink of light uh, uh, passes across the moon. So if, if, if anyone's interested, Absolutely. the next eclipse will be in Spain in 2026. All right, perhaps see you there. Palab Ghosh, thank you so much for all of your reporting and analysis. Well, you're watching BBC News here in Ohio. Totality is approaching. Uh, if you're not here in the United States, if you can't watch it in person, if you haven't got a pair of these glasses to hand or a colander or a projector or whatever you need, 
um, then remember, of course, you can watch it here on BBC News. And a warm welcome, of course, to our viewers who are also tuning in here in America on PBS as well. Um, and also, don't forget to go to our live page on BBC News. We've got a team of correspondents fanned out right across the country, keeping you all up to date with what they are seeing and experiencing and feeling. And you will be able to uh, see some of their blog posts as well as actually watch that path of the moon going right across the sun. Um, but of course, as we welcome our viewers, we can now bring in once again our science editor, Palab Ghosh, who is having uh, one of the biggest days of the year for any kind of uh, science correspondent. Palab, we are starting to get closer to totality uh, here in Ohio. It's getting pretty cold. People are starting to gather. I can feel the anticipation building even further. But just in terms of what would be considered a truly great eclipse, this surely has to go down as one of them. You know, 99% of people here in America experiencing it either partially or totally. That's huge. It is one of the most memorable eclipses of all time, partly because the sun is so intense. You can see the atmosphere so prominently and also because so many people will be able to see it. So you don't get that combination of things that often. So it is a really big event um, for as much the impact it has on people as, the, as well the science and the beauty of it all. Palab, something I always find astonishing is how long we've been able to predict eclipses for as occurrences, going back even a couple of hundred years, for example, here in Ohio, the last one was in 1806. There were eclipse chases then. Um, it is an incredibly exact and difficult science, one would imagine. It is. It goes like clockwork. You can work out where the next eclipse is, the one after that, the one after that. So you can book your hotel rooms already if you're interested in doing that. But, it, you know, you can decide whether you want to chase eclipses or experience the ones that uh, occur to you naturally. But it, it is as a reminder of just how incredible the, the cosmos is. And so there are so many people that after today, whether they're experiencing totality in North America or watching it on TV, that will become inspired by what they see and want to find out more. And it is no greater advertisement uh, for science than watching something so incredible and beautiful as this. Absolutely. Talking about, you know, getting the, the public on board. Uh, we know that there's also citizen science projects as well, aren't there? People can, you know, give insights to what happened to their pets, for example, during totality. And I do have to say uh, it is starting to get significantly darker here as I speak. But for the animal kingdom, for example, I mean, this is really confusing for them. It's confusing for them and it's confusing for people as well. There'll probably be a, a hush if there are any animals uh, around you. They're just wondering what's happening because nightfall isn't for some time yet. But also there'll, there'll be a hush uh, before the whoops start uh, uh, among people. The whoops will start once you get the beads that will start showing just as the last few rays of sun pass through the moon. Then there'll be that spectacular diamond ring effect, which you can really look forward to when the last chink of light just seems brighter than everything else. Then, of course, the, the showstopper, the atmosphere that will stretch out past the, the, the moon, which will hang in the sky like a shimmering black pearl in the sky. It'll be a moment of great awe and a great moment of celebration, which will bring people together. And there'll be huge cheering among people, but among, among the animals, I suspect they'll be very, very confused. At the end of the day, we're all just animals, I think, and we're all going to be bowled over by this event. We are just uh, 10 minutes away from totality here in Ohio. You were mentioning that moment of the, the diamond ring and then the chromosphere when we, you know, hopefully see more.